Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 38 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, and that is Gavin. Gavin, how you doing? I'm good, buddy. Um, I had a really interesting weekend, part of which we're going to talk about uh, today. Um, but I'm, I'm enjoying California. It's strange. Um, <laughs> <laughs> In a good way. Um, mostly. Okay. <laughs> um, the biggest thing, and I knew this was going to be a big thing for me going into it, because this was also something that I just generally didn't like about South Dakota, uh, was the lack of trees. Really? I don't, I don't no know trees. why or like very few, obviously I live in, like I live in a fairly good sized city. Um, mm-hmm. and yeah. so like there's trees along the roads and, and stuff like that. There's a lot of palms, which are not technically trees. Um, Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Wait, as, wait, I'm, can, I'm not change the podcast topic to this. Uh, I can do one eventually that will take a lot of background research because I know almost nothing about plants, but, okay. um, yeah, so there's a lot of palms and then certain other kinds of trees that you can tell are probably not native and shouldn't be here. Um, but like as soon as you get outside of the city, it's like the tallest plants are mostly like hip or so height. Occasionally, you'll get things like Joshua trees, which are also not trees um, that uh, okay. that get, Breaking news. you know, you know, like 10 or so feet tall. Um, some get even bigger. Uh But very few, like, actual trees. If you get a little bit south of me, uh, down towards Santa Barbara, there's there's more trees. But at least where where I am, there's really just not. And, like, a little personal anecdote. There was this one time, I think the first time that I drove home to New York from South Dakota. Mm -hmm. uh, I took a different way than I drove to South Dakota. So, uh, on the way home, I went through Wisconsin. And so basically I drove through all of South Dakota, which really doesn't have much trees outside of like um, a bunch of pine trees around the Black Hills. So I, d- I did see some trees there when I lived there. Uh, but then you drive west, in the, the eastern, or I'm sorry, you drive east and the eastern part of South Dakota is very uh, like agriculture-y. So it's very like, you know, lots of soy, lots of corn, stuff like that. Still no trees. Um, southern Minnesota is very much the same. Very agriculture-y. Lots of corn, lots of soy, no trees. But mm-hmm. very quickly after after I got into Wisconsin, I was just in the middle of this big old forest, <laughs> and I just like breathed in, and it was just like a big sigh, and I'm like, oh, I missed trees, and <laughs> <laughs> so I I definitely noticed a very sudden lack of trees as I got about halfway across uh, Oklahoma. Because eastern Oklahoma has lots of trees when I drove out here to California. Um, but as you get to like central and then western Oklahoma, they very suddenly disappear. And, but yeah, so that's been one of my biggest complaints. And if that's my biggest complaint, I'm not really complaining. I never would have thought of that, you know, lack of trees where you are. But yeah, I guess that makes sense. Well, there's less water over there. You know, you need water to grow trees. Yeah, that and, makes sense. Yeah. So I was, uh, this past week, my girlfriend and I, we went to, um, uh, we went to Washington DC and took a couple of days there. Oh, cool. And as, and as we were there, you don't know this yet, um, nor do the listeners. Um, uh, but as we were there, we were at the natural history museum and Ooh. the, ent- the entire time I was there, I was thinking this is a lot of fun, but I wish Gavin was here with me <laughs> to explain why all of this stuff was so cool. Cause a lot of it was really cool. And yeah. there were some things I was looking at and I was like. I'm missing something like I know yeah. this is awesome, but I'm not quite sure why I've, I've been to DC once, but I've never been to the Smithsonian. Uh, really? Yeah. Well, th- I went for the March for science back in 2017. Um, oh, it was really okay. cool. I got to see Bill Nye speak, not quite on the national mall, but very close to it. Right. Um, and that was pretty much all we had time for because we took a bus from central New York down there and had to be back that night as well. Oh, really? So, Yes, it was just a one-day bus trip. Um, but yeah, so that was that's the only time I've been to D.C. And I was in the city for probably five, six hours tops. And most of that time was spent protesting. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good five, six hours. Exactly. So, on with the actual uh, episode, you know, yes. shenanigans. Yes, let's get that going. We, we do have some things on the calendar today. 
So it is a twofer. It is on a weekend. So Mike, do you have a year guess for me? Uh, if we're doing it on a weekend, so I'm going to say this will be 2011. Close, but no cigar. Ah, jeez. So this Fire will low. be, uh, you're, you were in the middle of the two, but you were close oh, to one. Of course. You were, cl- you were close to one of them. Okay. Uh, so this was from this past weekend, August 28th and 29th. So for the 28th, our uh, This Day in Science comes from 2001. And the headline is okay. Cat- Catnip Finds uh, Use as a Mosquito Repellent, which I actually uh, knew somewhere in the Re- deep catnip? recesses. Yes. I, like I read that and I was like, I feel like I've heard that in like the very deep recesses of my brain somewhere. Okay. So it says the American Chemical Society announced the potential use of the plant commonly known as catnip as a mosquito repellent. The team claims that nep- I'm not great with chemical names. <laughs> Nepetalactone. Nepetalactone, I believe is how you pronounce that. I'm much better with like animal names, like scientific names of animals, just because I'm more used to it. But yeah, chemicals, not so much. But Nepetalactone, which gives catnip its odor, is almost 10 times more effective at repelling pests than DEET, the controversial compound commonly used in insect repellents. Huh. Hmm. Fun fact. Yeah. And then this next piece of news comes from 2013. So that was the one that you were close to, which is yep. more more in this podcast wheelhouse, uh, but one that I don't necessarily agree with. Although this is going to be wow. a longer episode, so I don't I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. But I'll I'll talk about it a bit. So the headline is mm-hmm. quote Terror birds unquote deemed not so scary. So a little background. Terror birds. Yes, we have talked about them a bit in our episode about the Great American Biotic Interchange when North and South America collided uh, about three, four million years ago or so and Mm -hmm. uh, interchanged some of their animals. Terror birds are a group of large flightless birds that were native to South America and were essentially the like dominant predators for most of the time since the dinosaurs in South America. Um, So... I'll I'll read it to you, and then we'll talk a little bit. So, paleontologists from the European University of Geochemistry published their research into the nature and diet of the ancient bipedal bird, commonly known as the terror bird. Okay, stop. How long has Um, this bird been known as the terror bird? So, I don't even know why it's called that, because at least with... um, Let's see, what... So, yeah, the... Prefix dino means terrible. Um, right. No derivative of that occurs anywhere in, in the, the name of the group for the birds. Um, so the the name of the group is are called the Forest Rackids. And they, uh, again, by all accounts, very much ate meat. Um I don't know how long they've been called the terror birds, probably since they were discovered some like newspaper that wrote an article called them that and it got popular. That's how things kind of happened like that back in the day. Um, it goes on to say, contrary to previous beliefs about the use of the birds frightening hooked beak, the team suggests that terror birds were actually herbivores. So I believe they are referring to one specific bird, not the whole group. I believe they're referring to the genus Klenikin or Klenkin. I don't remember if there's another E in there or not, but um, I believe that's the one that they're referring to. And I don't even know if that's actually a member of this group, to be honest. Let me actually look this up. And it'll take me a second because my new setup in the apartment is kind of janky. So I have to have, I have to type on this little, uh, portable keyboard thing. That's not very conducive. Okay. Okay. So this bird is called Kalenkin. So this one is a true terror bird, but apparently everything that I've been able to see is that it's still predatory. Like we kind of thought it was. So... Again, it's this whole thing that, I, that we've talked about several times where it's like one study doesn't r- really 
provide that much. If there were more studies that came out that corroborated this, I'd, I'd be more willing to believe it, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, if it's one study, I guess that makes sense. And we've talked about that a thousand times, how, you know, the what one study means and what one study doesn't mean. And also, so I did just look it up. So the one, it is not the one that I thought it was, uh, which, like I said, is uh, Kelenkin, I believe is how you say it. It's a weird name for a, a fossil. But uh, right. that that animal actually is a true member of the terror birds, which, again, is that single family called the Forest Rackaday. The one that they're actually referring to is called Gastornis, uh, which is not related really at all uh, and was found in Europe, which is actually what makes sense for, you know, the European University of Geochemistry to be studying. So, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, like, I, I don't believe that it's really, I, I believe the only thing that, like, actual scientists refer as terror birds are the members of this family, and like I said, this isn't. And as we actually talked about in an episode about flight, if given literally any chance to not be flighted, birds will take it. So, like, <laughs> yeah. birds, birds have evolved yeah. flightlessness many times, and this was one of them, Gastornis, which... Like I said, okay, this one actually makes more sense, but I believe that the study itself was only implicating this single, you know, species, not the entire group, let alone ones that are not even related. So, like, (laughs) calendar, (sighs) everything else besides the paleontology stuff seems like it's been okay. (laughs) You just need to get a better paleontology editor. I, I wonder if the other stuff is actually just as bad and it's only because and we just don't know any better <laughs> focus yeah right exactly that is yeah, very well could be that very well could be <laughs> anyway anyway speaking of paleontology let's let's get into our main topic for the day absolutely so this is going to be a really interesting episode about what is pretty much inarguably I feel like you could make a case for a couple of others, but really not many. Uh, but what is, by most paleontological standards, the best fossil locality uh, on the planet? And that would be one that is currently kind of in my backyard now, the La Brea Tar Pits. And you already knew that because you read the title. Note so. to self, the title of this would be the La Brea Tar Pits. <laughs> um, so, Mike, have you ever heard of the La Brea Tar Pits? It certainly doesn't ring a bell. Um, I, I don't want to say I've never heard of it, but I don't ring, doesn't ring a bell. Okay. Uh, it is incredibly famous for, A, its, its fossils, B, for, like, how well-preserved the fossils are. Not just, like, how many there are, but they're beautiful fossils. And then, also, because it is literally in downtown Los Angeles... <laughs> <laughs> I imagine that helps with the marketing. It sure does. So we're going to be talking about it. This fossil site uh, ranges from around 50,000 years ago. So very recent to essentially today because there's still stuff falling into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, things still get trapped in the quote unquote pits. Uh, we will talk about how the name is a bit of a misnomer how it's not really tar and they're not really pits. Um, But we we will get into the reasons why that is. So Mike, if you were envisioning something named the La Brea tar pits, what, what comes to your mind? I mean, what comes to my mind is tar. Like they're like just a field with black, you know, kind of sticky, maybe hot stuff. Like a, what Mm -hmm. comes to mind is like a hot spring, but with tar, like there's bubbles coming up. You know, like people like the 1700s would put that stuff in a barrel and then tar and feather some people. <laughs> like, like that's what comes to mind when I'm hearing tar pits. Okay. Um, so that is how it is very often depicted, including in, do you ever see the really terrible, but in a way that I love, uh, Will Ferrell movie, Land of the Lost? Oh, that is, we, we talked about our favorite bad movies a couple yes. episodes ago. Land of the Lost is definitely, I don't even, I don't know if it's I, quite a bad movie, but it's mm-hmm. definitely one of my favorite stupid movies. I believe that that is where Will Ferrell works, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, really? I believe that he's supposedly working, at least at the beginning of the film, I believe he gets fired for some reason. Uh, it's been quite a while since I've seen it, but uh, I believe that's where he works. But it's also depicted in many other movies, 
such as uh, the Tommy Lee Jones movie Volcano, um, among many others. It is easily the most like widely depicted fossil site because it is so famous and also very easily accessible to Hollywood. So, how did we're, we're so, going to sort of break this down in two ways? So, how did the tar get there? And then how did the animals get there? So. Tar and animals don't seem to, like, for me, they don't seem to coexist very well. Like. You would like be there's surprised. There's a whole bunch of tar somewhere. Huh, okay. So you, you would think so. You would think, okay, if there's this big, you know, pit of tar, you would think animals would be like, oh, I probably shouldn't go into that. Right. However, once we actually talk about it, that it is, like I said, neither really tar nor really a pit. Uh, it becomes much more easy to understand how this is such an incredible fossil locality because I'll get more into the numbers later, but this is by far like has the most fossils and the most beautiful fossils of any fossil site that I personally know of. All right. I have lots of questions and I assume that we're going to get into just about all of them. Yeah. So Um, And again, just to sort of give a little bit of a reference. So my fossil locality that I worked with, uh, total, there were, the way we do specimens is, like at at my school, the way they did them, not the way we currently do them, was, is not good. Uh, (laughs) So I think I believe, I, I believe I talked about that when I talked about my thesis, where it's like, there'd be multiple, like, unassociated uh, specimens under the same specimen number. Okay. That's not really how things should be done. So there ideally, if you, if it were counted correctly, around 1200 specimens that I worked with for my thesis, Mm -hmm. uh, representing, uh, off the top of my head, I I'd have to look at it, but not more than like 20 species. The La Brea tar pits. Uh huh. Yeah. Like 20 species tops. The La Brea tar pits represent. Over 650 species. Jeez, that's significantly more. That's There's a whole new digit added onto that number. Mm-hmm. And the last time that a total of the number of specimens from the La Brea Tar Pits was taken was 1992. So it's quite a bit out of date at this point. Mm-hmm. But back in 1992, they had three and a half million specimens. Oh. <sighs> They've been excavating this site for a hundred over a hundred years at this point. And it wow. is they're they're not really slowing down. They're they keep finding things all the time. So that this is again, not just because it's in LA, not just because the location's convenient, but because these fossils are super abundant, super diverse, and beautifully preserved. We will have a Google Drive uh for some photos that I took while I was there yesterday, because I don't remember if I said that, but I was there yesterday um, at the time we're recording this. I was just about to say yesterday, the time we're recording this two days ago from the time this will be released. Yep. So uh, I took those photos and they are absolutely beautiful. So circling back, how did the tar get there? So if anybody that's listening has ever been to LA, you might see some oil wells kind of just around. Not really what you would think of in like a major metropolitan city that there's just oil rigs um, just kind of by the side of the road. But because there's a particular stretch of L.A. that is very petroliferous, there's quite a bit of oil there. And as we talked about in our fossil fuels episode, most oil, at least terrestrial oil, I don't know much about like offshore drilling, um, but mostly oil in the United States anyway comes from either the Carboniferous period, the Permian period, or the Cretaceous period. So that is where most of those come from. However, the the oil-rich rocks around LA do not come from those time periods. And it's actually quite rare to get rocks this recent, because these rocks are from the Miocene, you know, less than 23 million years ago, uh, with, with oil like this. Which kind of makes sense, because all three of those periods, the Carboniferous, the Permian, and the Cretaceous, were quite a bit longer. So it's just, on average, more time for, you know, the 
oil to be created pretty much. Yeah. I mean, that's always like what I learned in school, like it just, it takes a really, really long time for oil mm. to, you know, like get created. And so if there's a time period that's more recent, that's just less time for it to have happened. Exactly. So I'll do a really quick uh, sort of recap on how oil is made uh, because it, it's actually quite important as to why this is the La Brea Tar Pits do not actually have tar because there's a difference. So uh, back in the Miocene epic, you know, like I said, uh, probably around 20 million years ago is when this was happening. Uh, LA and the whole sort of Southern California area was underwater and quite deep underwater. Uh, so as things at the top, at the surface of the water do photosynthesis, little single celled organisms, they do photosynthesis and, and take carbon out of the atmosphere. They then die and sink. If they're deep enough, eventually they'll get to a spot where there's not that much oxygen and they do not decompose normally as they would. So if they were decomposed normally, that carbon would get, you know, transferred into whatever organism is, is decomposing them and then moved, you know, back through sort of the food chain. However, if they're not decomposed, they sit there and they lock the carbon into rocks. If they get buried, uh, afterward, which conveniently they did, the Santa Monica range, which currently is uh, a little bit east of LA, was starting to be built and, and, you know, rising at this time. And when you build up mountains, that produces a lot more rock to be eroded. And so all of that extra erosion flowed into the ocean and covered this non-decomposed layer of microbes, burying it. And as more sediment just kept you know, being put up or put on top of it and put on top of it and put it under pressure and some heat. And it sort of broke down the more complex carbon uh, molecules in those single celled microbes into more simple ones uh, that then became sort of oil. We'll talk about that in a sec. Sort of oil. Yeah. It's, is that it's a technical term. No. <laughs> so it is essentially oil with some slight different chemical stuff that's honestly not that important for us to get into right now. Um, okay. Obviously, the, the you know, drills in LA are drilling something, you know. I'm, right. not also not, I'm also not a petroleum geologist, so I don't know the technical differences. Um, but what I do know is, you know, when you have all that organic matter from those microbes, and then you have a layer of sediment over top of them, if that layer of sediment is permeable has some gaps in it it doesn't do a good job of concentrating that oil and it can spread out in some areas uh it is capped off and concentrated well that's where the oil rigs are in some other areas sometimes if you happen to be in an area with lots of faults and lots of earthquakes you know that oil can sort of meander through that cap rock you know the layer of rock over top of it and make it to the surface and, and that is that's where we get tar pits from absolutely okay. and so which makes sense in california because they got the big fault the san andreas right that's like the one that gets a lot of attention but there are faults all over the place oh okay um like there are even there are a ton of faults in new york they're just not really active um if you look at like a geologic map of the adirondacks especially you'll find faults all over the place but um breaking news earth okay earthquakes cause earth earthquakes create faults um or at least you know help the formation of faults Wait, so what yeah well cuz all a fault is is you put some stress on a rock and a rock layer like a continuous band of rocks sort of breaks and one side slides past the other so they're not sort of uniform anymore that's a that's all a fault I thought a fault was just like the term for a boundary between no. two tectonic plates. Nope. What is that term then? That is a plate boundary. Wow. Oh, you're blowing my mind here and we haven't even gotten to the actual. All right. Keep going. Uh, f foreshadowing. We will be talking much more about faults and plate boundaries very soon. Not today, but potentially next week. So. I apparently I'm not prepared for that. <laughs> but no. So yeah, all a fault is, is just a break in rocks that sort of spans through multiple units. Um, so there can be many faults between 
that pocket of oil and the surface. And it just sort of squeezes its way through those faults from the pocket to the surface. And that's how we get what are called seeps. So it's not really a big hole full of tar. It is a seep. It's just sort of flowing out through the cracks because with all that rock pushing down on it, uh, it creates a lot of pressure. A lot of, a lot of pressure to force it up. Right. So it's like if you had like an air bubble underneath like a frozen lake, if you were to poke a hole or like put a straw through the ice to the air bubble, all the air would come out through the straw because the ice is pushing down on it and creating pressure. Similar thing. Makes total sense. Um, however, because it's so thick and goopy, as unprocessed oil usually is, um, it doesn't sort of come out with a, like like a geyser or something. It sort of just oozes out. And so what happens is when that oozes out, that is basically crude oil, but the sort of unstable parts of it uh, just sort of evaporate. You know, if you pour gasoline on the ground, eventually it will all just evaporate, right? So all of the evap, you know, the parts that can evaporate do, and it, it creates this really thick and goopy substance, not called tar, but called asphalt. I, this is the same asphalt that roads are made of? More or less. Okay. Uh, the, the stuff that we use for roads, I believe originally was sourced pretty much like this, but nowadays we just take crude oil and refine it. Um, but it's essentially the same process. You just get rid of all the parts that can be evaporated from crude oil, and then you have asphalt. So, it is not tar. Tar is actually, granted, again, I'm not a petroleum geologist, but tar, I believe, specifically has to be sourced from distilling, like, plant material. Okay. Not microbe stuff. And chemically, they are different. I don't fully understand why. I tried to find a good explanation for why. But basically, all I could find was a bunch of stuff on, like, uh, like paving companies trying to explain the difference. And I'm like, this doesn't seem very scientific, but okay, I'll just take your word that they are different. So <laughs> uh, they're not tar pits. They are asphalt seeps, but that is a much less cool name. So we're going with tar pits. I mean, I don't know. Asphalt's like, to me, that's hilarious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that is how the tar, quote unquote, got there. It started out as all these microbes got really concentrated, and then oozes up through the cracks. And so if you think about it, imagine if you had um, sort of a bottle of cooking oil, and you had that underwater. If you were to slowly let some of the oil out, it would get to the top, right? Because it's less dense. Eventually, yeah. And then it would spread out, right? It wouldn't form just like a big ball. It would spread out along the surface of the water. Yeah, right. Like, you know, so it would you know, spread off across the surface area. Yeah. That's essentially what the asphalt does. It doesn't create like a pit, like a hole. It just spreads out along the surface in like a very shallow puddle, maybe only a couple of, you know, an inch thick, maybe. But it is so viscous and sticky that once you are in it, you cannot get out. What do you mean cannot get out? It is essentially the cartoon version of quicksand or like the movie version of quicksand where it's like really? you, you step in it and you literally, no matter how hard you pull, you cannot get your foot out of it. And the more you struggle, the more stuck you get. So, I mean, my, I guess my question for that is, okay, I, I assume people have found this out. Mm -hmm. Did they cut their foot off were they left to die like is there we a, we will talk about human split? interactions with it oh okay then let, but will, but that is the that is the vast majority that's the vast minority because like i said there are three and a half million specimens from this site uh and i will give a little spoilers one of only one of them is human uh <laughs> <laughs> oh boy okay so all that oil and asphalt was sort of formed maybe around 20 to 15 million years ago and then was buried. And then over time, the, you know, oceans receded with the ice age as a lot of ocean water got locked up as ice at the poles. So ocean levels dropped. And what was, what was underwater 
was now on land in what we see today is the Los Angeles area. And we were pretty sure, I, I kept seeing numbers that said somewhere between 100,000 and 50,000 years ago is when the asphalt started to reach the surface. However, we don't start seeing fossils until around 50,000 years ago. So I would lean much more toward the 50,000 years ago because I don't think that it'd just be sitting there for 50,000 years and not collect any fossils. Right, that seems kind of unlikely. Right. Um, and granted, I don't study the site, so I, I don't really want to question all these things because I kept seeing it. So they must be getting that from somewhere. But somewhere... Well, I in, these people aren't just making it up. But... Right. So somewhere in the vicinity of 50,000 years or a little more uh, is when the asphalt started reaching the surface. And then things started getting stuck. <laughs> so... Uh, and it's actually really funny. Sometimes earthquakes, which, you know, happen somewhat frequently around LA, uh, will shift where the asphalt seeps reach the surface because they'll make new faults. Okay. So, so it's very funny. You'll find so, one picture in the Google Drive that's literally just like a bright green cone that says tar seeps with an arrow pointing down in that sometimes they'll just pop up in the middle of the park because the La Brea Tar Pits is in the middle of a park. You can go there completely for free, at least the park part. You have to pay for parking there, but I mean, it's downtown LA. So like you're going to pay for parking anyway. Um, But yeah, you can literally just go and, you know, play catch at this park. I I saw some people doing some just like running and walking with their dogs. Um, You'll just, you know, have to watch out for tar seeps. (laughs) That. That is cool because I was going to, at some point I was going to ask this, like, you know, is it still seeping up? And I get, you know, I guess absolutely. Yes, like this is an active thing that's happening. Absolutely. We went, uh, you know, my, my girlfriend and I both went there and we just sort of walked around. They have all like the big ones fenced off and then the smaller ones they have, I don't know how they cap them or if they do, but they put, like they said, those bright green cones. So it's like, you don't accidentally step in one. It'd be like very, very hard to accidentally get stuck. Uh, at the at the park itself, but uh, from what I've been told, sometimes after an earthquake, uh, a seep will just sort of show up in somebody's basement. In someone's basement. Yep. Oh. oh. Or if if you're trying to put That's down a found yeah, if you're trying to put down a foundation in the area for a new building, uh, you will encounter asphalt. That's basically that, that's pretty much what I was told. You will encounter asphalt if you dig in Los Angeles, particularly in this sort of band where a lot of the oil and uh, asphalt is. So that hazard of the area, I suppose. Yeah, I guess. And is that the same thing with other tar pits around the, um, like around the world or is this, you know, is the La Brea tar pit, like are those, is that tar pit like, you know, especially susceptible to seismic activity and having kind of new things pop up? No, there's there's quite a bit, just because, like I said, how the asphalt reaches the surface has a lot to do with earthquakes and faults and things. So a lot of tar or asphalt seeps uh, do tend to show up around sort of plate boundaries, like some of the more famous ones. I think there's a really famous one in Iran. Uh, there's one in Trinidad. Um, I believe there's actually one that might be mistaken on this, but I believe there's one in France. Well, that's not really that close to a plate boundary. Um, but so there, it, th- these are not an unheard of thing to happen elsewhere. It's just that this one has been studied the most by a lot uh, for reasons that we'll talk about uh, pretty much right now. So before we get into the, some of the animals, this area has a really interesting human history. We'll, we'll save that human fossil for toward the end, but like non-fossil human history, which I think is really interesting. So. Uh, first, obviously, you know, you can't really go without saying this, uh, first nations and indigenous people knew about this well before, uh, you know, Western scientists did. And it's really interesting lesson of this continent, I suppose. Pretty much. So it's, it's really interesting because they would use this asphalt, uh, namely the, uh, Chumash and Tongva people. I believe I'm pronouncing those correctly. Um, you know, obviously they used, they lived in the area. They knew that these were here, uh, but they actually used the asphalt to like waterproof their boats. 
And it's really interesting. You can find a lot of their artifacts on the Channel Islands, uh, which are off the coast of California. And, you know, we, we have, you know, their, we have, you know, preserved boats because they used asphalt to sort of waterproof the hulls of like their, their canoes and such. That would be like a cool, I would almost show it to my students when I teach them about uh, like Native Americans, you know, before, you know, before European show, because that'd be a really cool, uh, like artifact to show them if we could, mm-hmm. if there was anything you know, around this area to show them, which I'm sure there isn't, but even, even if it was online or to see pictures, cause that's a really cool like use of natural resources. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but the first sort of, you know, as we're sort of interested in the, in the science of it, the first written documentation um, by like the European explorers was actually in 1769 by a group of Spanish explorers, because at the time this was considered Mexico. Then a lot of uh, history happened in North America. Uh, and then by 1826, Mexico was an independent state. It was uh, independent from Spain by that point. And the L.A. area was owned by the country of Mexico. Uh, right. And the, and the area that is now the park, plus I think some of the land around the park, was uh, once part of a Mexican land grant. So sort of, I, I believe it's sort of analogous to like the, U- the United States Homestead Act. Sort of similar in that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was called Rancho La Brea. That is where it gets its name from. Because uh, rancho, you know, it's a, a ranch, um, but La Brea or Brea means tar in Spanish. So that is so why like it's called tar ranch. Pretty much, basically, just like okay, ran- ranch of the tar, ranch of it's, the tar. Okay. So, but they used it as you know an actual ranch. You know, they had all sorts of animals there, uh, and they would keep finding bones in the tar that now we know were probably fossils. But at the time, they were just like, nah, it's like an old cow that was in there at some point because they had cows that were in there. It was probably actually a bison. <laughs> but to people who don't really know any better, a bison skeleton and a cow skeleton look basically the same. Look, yep. Um, and even, you know, because we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll talk about the animals in a bit. But these people were ranching everything from, you know, cattle to uh, camels to uh, dogs and things. And these are all... They, all these animals have relatives that are found in the La Brea tar pits. So it's like they would find bones that look familiar enough to the animals that they were ranching. They just assumed, hey, one of my animals must have fallen in, in the tar. I mean, that's unfortunate, but yeah, I mean, hard to blame people at that point. Right. And it's it's a real interesting when you put it in sort of the context of that extinction and just the whole concept of uh, you know, things that used to be alive, not being alive anymore, at least like species wise, wasn't really a thing. Yeah. It had been talked about for sure, like among scientists, but definitely did not make it to like public attention because like this is the 1820s, right? Like the, the idea of extinction had not occurred to, or not, not that it didn't occur, but like, wasn't it a generally accepted scientific fact that there could be a species and then no more species. It definitely was not a, a scientific fact at that point, but you know, we talked a little bit about how long it can sometimes take for things after scientists know about them to get to like the public, let alone in the 1820s <laughs> when they didn't have the internet or really even like probably by this point, like a solid postal service. So uh, yeah, this was, <laughs> this was, Extinction and the possibility of these being animals, these, these bones being from animals that are not around today, was would have been completely foreign to anybody around at this time. So the first scientific paper published around about some of these bones was in 1875. So 50 years after uh, this area was sort of uh, proposed as like a land grant and given to, to the people that were ranching it. So uh, it was published by a guy named William Denton who was, I believe, based out of Boston. I don't really know what he was doing over there in California. but um, And then after that, not a whole lot happened. So we published this, and then it's not like a bunch of other people rushed over there to try and, and get stuff published. Around this time were the Bone Wars. So I think most paleontologists... I was, 
Yeah. I was going to ask, and I decided not to because I didn't want to throw you off track. This mm-hmm. sounds like the kind of thing in the right time period for the Bone Wars to show up. One of my favorite episodes that we've recorded. Yeah. So this was, at least so, that this first paper was published in 1875. So a bit before the Bone Wars, but the Bone Wars were very much heating up. So people were much more preoccupied with dinosaurs Bone Wars. in the like upper sort of west area, you know, Colorado, the Dakotas, Wyoming, people were very much preoccupied with dinosaurs. And this paper probably sort of fell under the radar because of that. But then... I mean, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, yeah, that that's unfortunate, but I get it. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I mean, you say it's unfortunate, but like I said, this is the literally the best fossil locality on the planet. So I don't think it really missed out on much. <laughs> Um, But yeah, then everything changed in 1901 when the oil geologist, W.W. Orkut, there's actually a town named after him uh, about 20 minutes from where I live here, uh, realized sort of the real significance of this site. And there's actually uh, a subspecies of coyote because they found just regular, the same coyotes we have today, sort of, uh, but a different subspecies after this guy because he was the first one to be like, whoa, man. Uh, this is real special. So after he sort of was he, like, he deserves that. You deserve to get he a species does. named after you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, that species by the way is, so the species of the coyote, you know, even the one we have today is Canis latrans, but, uh, he got a subspecies named after him that is found at the site. Canis latrans or cutty. Yeah. So after he sort of raised the alarm bell, a lot of other scientists became interested in the area and uh, the pits were sort of at peak excavation in the early 1900s, around 1910 or so. So again, this is, this is now post bone wars. There's still a lot of investment in paleontology at this time. T-Rex had just been discovered pretty much right before this uh, in, I think 1905, 1906. So like paleontology was still having a really good time. Just even though the bone wars were over, Paleontology was still doing real well. Many sort of local institutions got involved because at this time, Los Angeles was still a pretty, uh, it was obviously much smaller than it is today, but it was a decent population center. Uh, At the time, uh, UC Berkeley existed, so they sort of got involved. Uh, The LA County Museum of Natural History, that's what it's called today, and who I believe is sort of the parent museum to the uh, La Brea Tar Pits. But at the time, it was also on top of like natural history stuff, also involved art and more cultural things. Uh, But today is mostly just for natural history things. They got involved and had some dig teams out there. And uh, the Southern California Academy of Natural Sciences also, you know, all these many different interested parties digging up all of these different pits uh, during the 1910s. And by the end of the 1910s, we had over 750,000 specimens already. So just in the span of a decade, almost a million fossils came out of these pits. Has anything like that ever been done done before? You know, we're just in the first decade of this thing, like coming to, I don't want to say discovered, but like coming to mm-hmm. prominence, like, you know, three quarters of a million specimens. Like, has that ever been done anywhere else? To my knowledge, no. Wow. The the only one that I could think comes even close would be some of the um, quarries out of the Morrison formation during the Bone Wars. But that would be, again, the only thing that I could think of that would even come close. And I don't think those are even that close. Gee, that's, that's just a lot. That's so many. Mm-hmm. And How many un- days are in 10 years? Like, hold on, you, you do some talking. I'm going to do some math. Well, I'll just add, add a zero at the end of how many days in a year, Mike. Yeah, about about, about, th- about 3,600 days. All right, so we got 3,650. I know there's things with leap years in there. I'm ignoring Yeah, that's okay. 750,000. Mm-hmm. We're going to do a dividing. That's sure. 205.47 specimens a day. Yeah, that's just mm-hmm. like I I have no words for just the the it's rapid absolutely pace insane of discovery. And so, 
unlike the Bone Wars, they were actually doing some pretty good science at this time. Uh, in fact, we've talked a little bit about Nalmas in the past, which are North American land mammal ages, because that's what I worked with with my thesis. Basically, smaller chunks of time within sort of like the normal chunks that you hear about, like the Miocene, the Pliocene, smaller chunks of time. And there is one of these North American land mammal ages named the Rancho La Brea North American land mammal age after this site. And that was named so early because they knew very quickly that they had something incredibly special here. And by the, also by the end of the, the 1910s here, uh, they had over 300 species identified from, from the tar pits, 300 species compared to like, like I, I feel like the next most diverse site that I'm aware of um, would probably be, uh, it's called the gray fossil site in uh, Eastern Tennessee. They've got a couple hundred, maybe 250 or so. Um, but again, nowhere, nobody else even comes close. That after 10 years, they've got 300 species. Nobody comes close. Yeah, that, I mean, I, I have nothing to say at this point when it comes to that, you know, that rate. Like I said, this was like the peak, uh, at least of excavation. And so uh, things kind of slowed down a little bit after that until 1969 when, so they, they number each of the pits just, you know, in ascending order. Uh, and you can go there and, you know, like I said, it's just at this park, you can see, you know, here is where, you know, pit whatever is. And you can literally look down into it and see if, if there's people working there. You can see them working on the fossils. It's really cool. Um, but the one that you'll probably go to if you go to the park is called Pit 91, which is incredibly famous because uh, from just this one pit, the number of species known from La Brea pretty much doubled because in 1969, they actually started doing modern fossil tech, you know, excavation techniques where they kept track of, you know, the orientation of the fossil, uh, you know, what position was the fossil in when you dug it out of the ground? Uh, things like what part of the pit did it come from? Not just it came from pit number, whatever, you know, did it come from, you know, the West side? Was it facing West? You know, things like that. Cause we got so much new science out of it because they started doing modern techniques. But the big one was that they started looking for small fossils because up to this point, they were only looking for the big stuff. Things like the bison that I mentioned earlier, things like mammoths, mastodons, big stuff that people look at and think, wow, that's amazing. But I was gonna say we've we've talked about that before, like you know, just the mm -hmm. bias towards finding something big and cool and less people are interested in, you know, whatever smaller fossils might exist. Is that part of the reason why? That's exactly why. And not, I mean yep. also just techniques for finding those things uh, you know, got better. So they started paying attention to the smaller fossils, and just from that one pit, so many new species were found at the site. Um, and so, like I said, you, you can go visit Pit 91, and they have a sign uh, about how many large animals were found from the site. Just that one pit. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read off some stuff here. So a little bit of spoilers for some of the animals that we find here. Um, but just How, how this, big is this pit, by the way? Um, I would say maybe 30 feet by 30 feet. <laughs> That's not that big. No. Like you could maybe push it to like 50 by 50. Um, and then the platform that you sort of stand at, if you're not obviously in the pit working on it is at most 15, 18 feet above it. So in a space 50 by 50 by we'll say 10, 10 to 15 feet, uh, they found this is, this is not including any of the small stuff that I said, you know, is much more diverse just because, you know, how, I, I looked up earlier how many species of rodents lived in New York, just out of curiosity. And it, it spoilers, it's a lot. Um, just because, you know, for every species of large animal, there's probably like 10, 15 species of small animal, uh, just because that's how population dynamics work. But so again, just from this one spot, they found 73 saber tooth cats, 56 dire wolves. Six, 16 coyotes, 
12 bison. Not the same bison we have today, a different species, but closely related. But still, that's cooler. Uh, 13 Western horses. Not the horses we have today. The horses that we have today are not from North America. These ones were native. Six uh, is called, you, you'll probably hear it as Harlan's ground sloth, uh, but it is Paramylodon harlani, uh, a species of ground sloth that was um, slightly bigger than like St. Bernard size. So like a pretty good sized animal. Had six of those. Six American lions. Four short-faced bears, which are quite a bit larger than polar bears. Two extinct camels uh, in the genus Camelops, and one mastodon. From this one fifty by fifty by fifteen pit, wow! That is how dense mm. these fossils are packed. I can imagine why this has been a uh, mm-hmm. a site that scientists keep coming back to. Yeah, and I really think that so overall, this is a pretty fair assessment of at least the large animals that have been found at the site uh, in in all the pits in general. Um. Basically, if you watch the movie Ice Age, most of the animals that you find can be found at the La Brea Tar Pits. What, what, sidebar, what do we think of Ice Age the movie? Do we, are we pro? Oh, it's, we an, it's, an, it's an excellent movie. Okay. Hands down. Great movie. Haven't seen it in a little while. The sequel is eh, not so much, but the first one is great. Yeah. There are some animals that shouldn't be there, but mostly it's fine. Yeah, I think I started like rewatching it one time and then my girlfriend was like, no, nope, we're watching something else <laughs> before I got too deep into it. Yeah, that's fair. Um, She's looking at me right now because she has no idea what we're talking about, but she knows. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so the really interesting about this site, so that's sort of it for like the human sort of interactions with it. And, you know, after, you know, Pit 91, things sort of went sort of well, although side tangent here, something that's not actually my notes, it should be, but it's not. I think in 2006, they were actually expanding the parking lot for the Los Angeles County Art Museum, which is nearby the park. And they had to do a really big salvage operation because I think they were building a new parking structure and they dug. And of course they found lots and lots of fossils, Mm -hmm. Um, but they didn't stop the construction, you know, because it's like, well, we, we, we need to do this. You know, we had this plan for a really long time uh, Mm -hmm. and put so much, you know, museum funds aside for it. So they had to basically block up. So like take these big blocks of, you know, because once it gets buried, it sort of solidifies a bit. It's not, entirely all goopy uh once it gets buried but uh they just put it in these big boxes and they're still excavating those today that was in 2006 so 15 years ago uh, and they're still working through all those uh stuff i believe that's called project 23 if you want to look into that a little more <laughs> um project yeah. that sounds like a fake thing that somebody made up yeah, yeah, project 23 <laughs> uh i believe it's called because they had 23 boxes well, you know so, what? fair enough um, but yeah, so that's sort of the most recent major thing that happened, that's happened with the pets. So what interests me the most and what interests a lot of scientists the most about the Librea Tar Pits is that the, the time that it captures, like I said, around 50,000 years ago until basically today, what that includes is a time before, during, and after the most recent glacial maximum. So when the glaciers were at their farthest extent south you know during the like the maximum ice age so we got to see and while the glaciers did not really come anywhere near los angeles we get to see some really interesting you know ecosystem transitions happen basically i I can imagine because like even if the glaciers didn't actually reach the tar pits like the climate of the planet and of that area has to have changed over those times. Yeah. Uh, and from, from what I was able to find, obviously this is sort of the best source of information about this time on the planet. Shocker. Uh, but generally, uh, when it comes to like biomes and plants, because we have a ton of plant information from these sites as well, not just animals, which is relatively rare to have a lot of plant information and a lot of animal information in the same place, just due to how plants and fo- uh, and animals fossilize differently. But generally, fairly similar biomes to today, but more south than they currently are. So if you go about uh, five hours or so north 
of LA to maybe a little north of like San Francisco. That's essentially the same environment because like I said, this is not that long ago. So like most of the the plants, especially, but also the animals that are found in La Brea are still alive today. You know, it's, it's really not, it's not like we're talking about a hundred million years ago or something. Mm-hmm. So basically if you just take the environment around you know, maybe a little north of San Francisco and just shift that down to LA. That's essentially what you got with some very noticeable uh, exceptions, such as things like mammoths and stuff that we're going to talk about in a little bit here. But uh, I want to introduce a couple new terms here. Some of my favorite terms, partially because I was lied to about them. Do I need to remember them? No, not at all. But they're just fun for me to talk about. All right, let's do it. So, uh, there's a term in paleontology called Lagerstatten. Is a German word. I was told. I was told when I learned this term, and I looking back, it was probably facetious. Um, but I was told that this meant mother load in German. Uh, it was spoilers. It's that's not actually what it translates to. Um, <laughs> I believe it literally translates to storage space. Storage space. Yes, which I mean makes sense. Essentially, it is just a really, uh, you know, a really, really good fossil locality. And there's two different types. There's a sort of, uh, it's called Konzentrat, Lagerstätten, you know, a high abundance of fossils. And then there is a Konservat, uh, Lagerstätten, which is a conservation Lagerstätten where they're really well preserved. This is the extreme example for both of those, because as I've said a couple times, these fossils are beautiful because the, the, the way that this sort of worked was they didn't sink down in the tar. They would step, get stuck, and then they would starve to death and sit at the surface. However, okay. Scavengers were not really able to rip them apart and, you know, disassemble them as scavengers do without also getting stuck. Mm -hmm. So, if you notice, when I talked about Pit 91, we had a lot of predators. You know, the three most abundant things were saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, and coyotes. In, you know, if you poke around, even like the most wild uh, sort of area of basically the entire world, you will not find that high of a concentration of predators anywhere, not even close. So this was a really great example of a predator trap because what would happen, trap. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what would happen is say a mammoth gets stuck, dies. All the carnivores around are like, Ooh, free food. I don't even have to fight the mammoth. It's already dead. Cool. But free food. They know. Right. So they go and they try to eat it. They get stuck. They die. Other predators are like, hey, more free food. They're not going to not eat it because it's another predator, you know? Mm-hmm. They just see it as more free food. So more and more predators get stuck, whereas, like, all you needed was one mammoth to get stuck there and die. And you could get, you know, dozens of predators that would try to come and eat it. So, by far, the most common animal... In at least like large scale animal, they have lots of invertebrates and things because like obviously flies and things like that are attracted to dead bodies too. Um, but the most abundant animal, you know, large, large bodied animal is by far dire wolves by a lot. Um, and for anybody not familiar, they're very much like, you know, modern wolves, but larger. Um, modern if you've, wolves, if you've seen, if you've seen Game of Thrones, you're familiar. Um, I don't. I didn't actually see Game of Thrones. I've just been told that they're in the show. Uh, but yeah, um, I, I haven't seen I, it either. I have a little bit of a nitpick about the dire wolves, but we'll get there in a minute. Um, but there's so many of them that at the museum at the Librea Tarpus, there's an entire wall of I believe I looked up a number and I believe it was 404 dire wolf skulls, just out on display, covering an entire wall. And it's like, those are the ones they had to spare. So it's like, they had so many. I believe the the last number that I was able to find was like four or 5,000 dire wolf specimens. 
four or five thousand. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got nothing. And so, obviously, there are lots of other predators around saber tooth cats as well. Uh, we're all are also very common in La Brea. However, uh, you know, I, I believe they're the second. No, I think the second most common from what I was able to find at the museum. Now I'm just kind of racking my brain going through some of the exhibits were coyotes, which makes sense. You know, there's more mm-hmm. of them in an environment than there are like the big predators. You know, there's going to be more coyotes in environment than bears. Right. So, okay. Lots and lots of things. Again, if you look at the environments in California, most of it's going to be there. They had lots of garter snakes, frogs, fish, and some like freshwater snails, which I'm kind of confused how they got there. And it didn't really explain it well how you get fish wandering into that. Okay. I would assume like a flood would happen and some of the fish would get stranded. That's what I would guess, but I don't know. Um, you have things, you know, everything from like deer, horses, camels, um, short faced bears, uh, were really, really common. Uh, in particular, uh, the, the main, I believe the only genus of, uh, bear they have there is, uh, called Arctotus, which I said, you know, short-faced bears, very, very large bear, as big, if not bigger than polar bears, very, very large bear, only make up a co- like less than a percent of like the large mammals found at this place because bears wow. just generally don't fossilize very well. Um, they just tend to not live in places that leave good fossils. Uh, but this is still the best uh, Arctotus fossil locality in the world. They make up so little, but they're so well preserved, and there's still that many of them because there's one percent or whatever of three and a half million, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So, like I said, about ninety percent of all the species in La Brea are still alive today, um, with the exception of many of the large Pleistocene animals, uh, which I think we've talked about very briefly. But at the end of the Pleistocene most of the large mammals went extinct. Things like your mammoths, your mastodons, uh, most of your species of bison, uh, you know, things like Arctotus and, and giant ground sloths, things like that. But, interestingly, and this kind of, it makes sense once you think about it, but I didn't, I, it surprised me at the time. Only around 60 species of the about 650 uh, known species are mammals. So that includes everything from your mammoths to your mice, you know, Wow. which again, surprised me until I, that was why I was actually looking up the number of species uh, of rodents in New York. I think total, not including uh, like whales and things, there's only like 65 species of rodent or of uh, mammals native to New York. So I'm like, okay, that, that makes sense. I guess that sounds about right. Okay. Okay. I mean, it almost seems low at first. Time, right. And I have no idea like what I'm even like, I have no idea what to base that on. So, right. So it's like compared to like that, again, that also struck me as low, uh, but looking more into it, it seems fairly normal and you almost never get everything preserved at a fossil locality. Anyway, there will be some animals that just escape the fossil record. That does happen. Uh, but it looks like, you know, compared to some modern places today that doesn't seem too far off from what it should be. Interestingly, Mm -hmm. however, uh, and this did not surprise me at all. Uh, 140 species of birds are known from the tarpits, which didn't surprise me because birds are incredibly diverse. It surprised me a lot because birds have a, as we talked about, birds do not fossilize well at all. They're very fragile, but Right. You have the hollow bones, right? Right. But it's like, if you fall and get stuck in the tar pit, it's not like some scavenger or other bird can really come get you. So you, it they just preserve, again, beautifully. Uh, and as, as I sort of alluded to, tons and tons of arthropods and plants. Namely... Uh, you know, lots of different types of beetles and things that would come and try to, you know, get to the dead bodies and, and you know, be part of the, like the decomposition process would get stuck. And again, just incredibly well preserved. You could, you know, make out all of their individual legs. You can make out like shell casings and things like that in just detail that you don't get outside of like amber. 
And just because this oil is so good at preserving these, because the, the biggest part of things not being preserved well is scavengers. Things have to be covered basically immediately before anything can eat it. And the tar is great for that. Um, and then the plants, I, I, again, I'm not a plant person. I don't have almost anything to like knowledgeable to say about plants other than Mm -hmm. I would not be surprised if like most of the species, like if the most diverse group would be plants just because there's plants everywhere. Uh, Mm -hmm. and it's also part of the plants also contribute to things, the animals getting stuck as well. Cause a bunch of leaves falling and getting stuck in the tar would pretty much just make the tar look like ground. You know, <laughs> so that would be, that's like a Scooby-Doo trap. Exactly. But not like leaves and seeds and even pollen that would get stuck in the tar. Again, amazingly preserved. And with the pollen, we get a beautiful uh, sort of record of plant changes on large scales in this entire region throughout time. So that's kind of how we know so much about the, the transitions between, you know, pre glacial maximum through post glacial maximum. Uh, the, the plants are what mostly tell you about that. And then, like I said, one single human remain it was found in 1914 and she is known as the La Brea woman. So if you want to look up more about her, uh, they had a whole little thing uh, about her in the museum, but do we know how old, like was found in, tw- in 1914? Like, you know, did she fall in 1913? Like, the, no, do we have her ID? Nope. So, but we were able to get uh, geochemical dates from her bones. Okay. And so she died somewhere around 10,200 years ago. Ah, okay. So yes. This is, this is an old girl. Old, old. Not that long after, granted, my human history is not amazing, uh, but not terribly long after humans got to North America, this woman fell in and died. <laughs> uh, but there's a decent amount of human wow. artifacts from, you know, everything from like uh, pottery, things like spear points, things like that, uh, that have been found in the pits as well. And also, surprisingly, uh, a roughly 3,000 year old dog like domestic dog. And it was found so closely with the La Brea woman that they thought that they were buried together or died together at first. But after, you know, better dating techniques, they're, you know, obviously like 7,000 years apart. So it just kind of got lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, although, so I want to end off, uh, actually, I want to preface this part because I'm going to have some nitpicks here because one of the big parts, Yeah. One of the big parts of La Brea is that it's so well known. It gets probably millions of visitors a year. It's in downtown LA. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But it's, you know, a big part of, you know, science communication is what they do. So obviously I have some critiques for this, but I want to preface this with staying up to date on paleontological things is basically an impossible task. Even yep. for people with good, you know, funding and that this is all that they do. Um, but there were some things where I was a little disappointed in them. So hopefully eventually somebody hears this and they change it. So dire wolves, we talked about them a couple times. Um, mm-hmm. They were originally, or I guess up until recently, uh, in the same genus as dogs and wolves, Canis. Um, they were Canis dirus. However, I believe two years ago, uh, a study came out that was fairly conclusive. You know, it's not one where I saw it and was like, mm, I want to see another paper. This one was fairly conclusive, mm-hmm. basically saying that they're not all that closely related to dogs and wolves. They're in the same sub tribe of, you know, taxonomy, but they're not closely related really at all. So they're no longer in the genus Canis. They're in their own genus called Anocyon. And that has been a thing for probably two, three years. Okay. But no everything, sign. yep, every, everything there still said Canis Dyrus. And I'm like, okay, eh, you've got so many of them, it probably is just a pain <laughs> to go around and relabel all of them. But, but still, like that, you know, mm-hmm. like that, you know, when I was at the Smithsonian this weekend, like, 
there was President Joe Biden, which mm-hmm. has been that way for, you know, eight months. Like, you know, if this is your thing, then this is your thing. Right, exactly. Especially with how this place is known as like Direwolf Central. Basically, any study done on direwolves come from La Brea. There are thousands and thousands of them. Um, some relatively more recent news. This one, um, this one, I give them a pass on because it is relatively recent. Um, but I believe either very early this year or sometime late last year, um, the mastodon. There's traditionally been one species of mastodon around at the late Pleistocene. Uh, called M- Mammut Americanum, the American Mastodon. Uh, however, uh, uh, again, a very conclusive study. They did a lot of really good work. Didn't really leave me with any weird impressions. Uh, named a new species of ones pretty much west of the Rockies called Mammut Pacificus, the Pacific Mastodon. Um, the the sort of descriptors that they used were really good and very obvious it's like i don't know how they missed this to begin with um all these differences but you know that's just sort of the 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 dogma you know if it's found late pleistocene north america and it's a mastodon it's this Mm -hmm. so but everything there still said american mastodon which i actually think that'd be one that they'd want to change because that's super cool and really recent and it's it's a mastodon it's an elephant you know people love them yeah, that's that's one that, like, like once again, I get it's hard, but if this is your thing, then mm-hmm. like you gotta you gotta be on top of this, right? But at least with all of those, both the the mastodons and the the direwolves, they were consistent, and that everything said, it, I mean, it was depending on who you ask, technically incorrect, but at least they were consistent across the entire park. The next one was not, and this one is probably the one that bothers me the most, with the American lion which is Panthera atrox. It was originally way back in the day called Felis atrox in the same genus as like things like your cat, uh, a couple other species of wild cats as well. Uh, but not the same genus as like your tigers, your lions, your panthers, um, or I guess your jaguars, but not just that. The fact that it was inconsistent across a lot of the different exhibits, it was either called the American lion, which is what I know it as. That's what I always heard it as. I also mm-hmm. heard it called a giant jaguar. Or I, I guess I had not heard it, but they had it at La Brea. Same species, Panthera atrox. But in one at one exhibit, it was called the American lion. At a different exhibit, it was called the giant jaguar. Uh, at a different exhibit, it was called Neagle's giant jaguar. And I'm like, who is this Neagle person? Uh... And it was just inc- very inconsistent across all the things. So I'm like, that one kind of bothers me. Cause, and I actually looked it up and there is a reason for it. Cause it's like, it has some features that are really closely related to lions and, and tigers and some that are more closely related to jaguars. But it's like, just pick one and go with it or have a dedicated exhibit explaining that somewhere. Right. Like it, you can take the time to explain why there's different names or you can just pick one, but you got to do one of those two. You can't just exactly. have different names. And you can't have different names and then not explain why. Because people are going to think they're different things. People like me. Exactly. And it's like, I, well, and I was confused enough by it. And it's like, well, my master's thesis was mostly focusing on mammalian taxonomy. And also I ended up looking it up and there's a, an article uh, that we'll probably link to as well in wired.com with somebody also being like, Hey, I went to La Brea, like one of their writers being like, I went to La Brea and was really confused by this. So I did some research and I'm still confused. Um, So we'll link, we'll link that article uh, in the show notes as well. But uh, yeah. Anyway, those are all my nitpicks, not major, but the so many cool things about the La Brea tar pits. And I've been very rambly this episode. I'm very tired. It was a very long weekend. Uh, <laughs> cause we were down in LA for other things as well. But if you are ever in the LA area and you have $15, because that's how much it costs to get in, or you could even go to the park, the park itself is completely free, but if you want to get in and see the museum and that giant wall of, uh, uh, dire wolf skulls, it's $15, which I think is fairly reasonable to be honest, but considering uh, what you're getting, absolutely. And also considering you're in LA, like what else are you going to do in LA for $15? <laughs> yeah. 
but if you are ever in the LA area, cannot recommend it enough. Please go there. Again, the most beautiful fossils I have ever seen in my life, like in person. Uh, there are some that might come close from somewhere else, but boy, they'd have a really hard time convincing me. Um, but yeah, one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. And it definitely, it definitely sounds like it's a cool thing that you would normally expect when you're in LA. Exactly. Like, right. Going to see, you know, nature kind of thing, at least for me. And I've never been out that way. Like mm -hmm. it wouldn't be high end. My like, yeah, there's probably other stuff going on, but no, this is, I mean, how far away was it from you? So from where I live? Yeah. Like, I mean, LA is like three hours for me. Yeah. Like that's not, you know, that's not that bad. Considering like you have to drive that, like I mentioned some of the fossil localities, uh, in the Morrison formation, uh, were some of the ones that I could think of that might come close. Uh, those I that I've also been to, uh, I had to drive at least three hours just to get there, and they're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so it's like, well, if you're going to drive three hours, you might as well go to L.A. <laughs> you may as well. May as well do it. So is that all we have on the La Brea Tar Pits? Absolutely. And I would love to do another episode uh, about them at some point, just sort of going through more in more detail some of the climate information and a lot of the like environmental transition information but there's only so much you could fit in however long this has been uh <laughs> so well we'll uh, have to add that one to our non-existent list that one of these days we'll actually write down all the ideas that we have but this has been episode 38 of i wish you were dead a podcast about things that used to be alive Thank you, Gavin, for teaching us all about the La Brea Tarpits, and we'll see everybody next Wednesday.